elevating the discussion while talking about the things that matter most. You're listening to Society and the State. Life, liberty, and your pursuit of happiness. Now, your hosts, Connor Boyack and Brian Hyde. Welcome to Society and the State. I'm Brian here along with Connor. And Connor and I are very recently returned from a common experience in Atlanta. Both of us had the opportunity to attend uh, the Foundation for Economic Education's annual conference called FECON. And I don't know about you, Connor. I think I saw you say some pretty pretty nice things about it. I think it was a good experience for you. I think I saw that on social media. Tremendous experience for me as well. One of the things that made that such a great experience was we were in a circle of influencers and I think both of us had opportunities to expand our personal networks of influence. And so today we're going to talk a little bit about networking and how to do it and why to do it and why it matters. And, and I think most people, when they think networking, Brian, think of business networking. Well, yeah, multi-level oh, networking. Oh, yeah. Oh, boy. We're not going to touch that one on today's episode. Um, but, but yeah, like, so, for example, in a past life, I was a web developer. And I was part of an organization for about a year called BNI, which is, I think, nationwide. I think it stands for Business Networking International. I guess it's international by the name. And so I was part of a local chapter here, and the whole point was you'd meet, I think, weekly, and you would bring references for people. So you'd have your core group, and there would be an insurance salesman and a car salesman and a web developer and a pharmacist and, you know, whatever, different professionals, and you would um, use the opportunity to bring referrals to people so that you would kind of circulate referrals. And, and when most people think networking, I think they, they think that way. And that's all well and good. And for most people, um, you know, that is uh, the, 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 the purpose of, of networking. That's kind of the end-all, be-all. I think for purposes of today's episode, we want to talk more about influence networking. How do you extend mm -hmm. your influence? How do you persuade more people? How do you grow your audience? Whether uh, you're just a blogger or you're just a, a stay-at-home mom or you're a guy with very limited time because of, you know, work and, and family obligations. But wherever you are in life, how do you increase your influence? We all have great ideas. We all have things we want to do beyond what we're already doing, hopefully. If not, you know, go meditate or something and figure that out. But for those of us who have ambition and goals and ideas and projects and side hustles, the question is how do you grow that, that audience? So, Brian, I think let's use you as an example, right? Um, this influence networking, you've kind of leveled up re recently with FECON and, and some of these other things that you're doing. Um, talk to us about what that's been like, because you're newly transitioning into meeting people of influence that are going to help you in, in the work that you're now doing. What's that process been like for you? It's, it's been very liberating in the sense that uh, there I, I don't have any corner on the market of good ideas. Um, I don't know if you're familiar. Are you familiar with Malcolm Gladwell's book, The Tipping Point? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So there's three archetypes he talks about, mavens, connectors, and salespeople. Mavens are kind of the, uh, they're the ones who make things happen through information and ideas, they're the people in the know. They're the Connor Boyacks, the people you go to <laughs> when you say, Connor, how does this work? And, and, and they have the answers. Connectors are people who um, they know the right people. They may not, may not have the answer, but they can point you in the right direction. And then salespeople are the ones who use persuasion to get out there and, and to sell the ideas. And I don't know exactly where I fall in that. I'm probably more of a connector at this point. But there is, is something to be said about widening your circle of influence. Have you ever seen the, the movie 10,000 B.C.? Mm -mm, no, I haven't. Okay, I highly recommend it. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting flick, but there, there's a, a story in there. It's, it's basically about a bunch of uh, not quite cavemen, but pretty close to it, um, who, are, who encounter a much more advanced civilization, probably something akin to the Egyptians, who capture a bunch of them, take them into slavery. And so the decision's made to go and mount a rescue mission. And the guy who's called upon to, to lead that rescue mission is having serious doubts. Am I really up to this? Is this something that I could do? And his friend sits down and tells him, he says, you know, in, in every man's life, um, he says there is a circle of people for whom he is responsible. And he says for, for most men, it involves his wife and his children and, and the, the family immediately around him. For others, that circle is larger and it includes their friends and it includes, you know, their, their tribe or their village. But he says uh, around some men, the circle is very, very large. And it encompasses many thousands more. And he tells him, you are one of those individuals. And the lesson that it taught about influence, that was really for me, the, uh, that was an epiphany of um, what do I really want to do with my life? Do I mm. want to build a monument to myself or do I want to use whatever influence I have as wisely as possible? I've been a radio host for a long time. 
and and had some influence in that respect. Yeah. But there comes a point where you're bumping up against the upper limits of of that influence, and to be able to reach beyond those limits means you have to be able to reach into a larger circle of influence. Um, going to FeeCon and meeting uh, many of the writers and the influencers and people who um, whose material I have shared with my listening audience over the years, that was a, I mean it was okay from a fanboy standpoint it was kind of kind of a neat little buzz. Wow, this is yeah. really cool. Yeah. But it, it wasn't. It, I I didn't feel like I was going to them as a supplicant so much as um, rubbing shoulders with them and learning from them the best ways to use influence and in return hopefully you know sharing what I had to offer as well. I'm glad you touched on that point because that's where I wanted to take things. If you want to build a network and if you want to extend your influence, there has to be something of value that you offer. This has to be an exchange. You know, Occasionally I'll get people um, emailing me, for example, who want to meet. And if I feel that they don't offer any value, I'm sorry, but I got like a bajillion things to do. You may be a great person. I just can't afford to do it. If there's, and it sounds selfish, right? But if there's not something in it for me, if I don't think you can assist me or, or, um, or that there's some side of, uh, sort of value exchange, or even like if I feel that in spending time with you, it's really going to help you to the point where I, I gain value from the satisfaction of helping another person. It's not just someone wants to meet me and take me out to lunch and that's it, right? There has to be some sort of value creation in the process, not necessarily for the person, um, uh, you know, on the other side. Uh, it may be a more one-sided thing, but there has to be a case made why that relationship is going to produce value and not just be a, oh, I'm a fanboy or I'm a, you know, I love what you do. Like, okay, like think of a celebrity walking, you know, down the red carpet or, or you know, down the street and someone comes up and asks for an autograph. Right. Like, OK, great. That that celebrity is kind of annoyed, maybe a little bit. Maybe they're humble and they're you know cool about it. But but there's no real like value exchange there. But when you sit down with someone, let's say you're a, a blogger and you've been writing about inspiring entrepreneurs and then you later have the opportunity to meet that entrepreneur and say, hey, I, you know, I wrote this thing about you. I really admire what you do. I'd love the opportunity to do a follow up interview with you. You know, that there's kind of some value being created there um, in exchange in the process. If we want to network, if we want to grow our audience, you have to be able to um, command a presence, as it were. You need to be able to talk and, uh, to the person on the other side of that relationship and say, here's what I bring, here's what I'd like you to bring, imagine what we're going to create together. And it's that kind of synergistic effect where I've seen the best networking. Brian, when you sit down and say, you know, look, hey, I, I've got this new, you guys at Loving Liberty are creating this new app where you can distribute content far more broadly, right? And so when you sit down and you go to, let's say, a podcast host or a radio host and say, Love what you're doing. Here's what we're doing. Imagine what would happen if we worked together. You know, it's like a man and a woman saying, imagine the beautiful babies we could create, right? Like the, the Liberty babies, right? Like that's, <laughs> Somebody <laughs> needs to trademark that phrase. <laughs> the, the freedom, you know, progeny. Um, but, but I, you know, in a, on a serious note, right, when I sit down, let's say, um, okay, when I was at FECON, you were there for this Loving Liberty project you're working on. I was there for the Association for Teaching Kids Economics and the Tuttle Twins. When I sat down with um, some individuals from another country who really like the Tuttle Twins and want to bring it to their country, there's a value exchange there because they don't want to have to recreate the wheel and create their own children's series. I don't. Uh, I, I want to figure out how to get into that market and expand our influence and the reach of, of this book series. That's a win-win situation. But if I had nothing to offer... Um, then there would be no value in meeting with individuals like that. And so I think the networking potential really takes off, Brian, when you've been creating a little bit of value or you have a, a network of your own or you have some influence that you can then join with that other person synergistically to extend the reach and influence of both of you. I think that's where the magic really starts to happen. And this, this plays very well into uh, free market economics as well. And I think this is something both of us encountered at FeeCon um, there is no one right way. There's no one person who is going to be the single answer for this is how we will perpetuate liberty and free markets. Um, there's, there's a great division of labor. And the beauty of that is there are many, many people all working on solutions in their own way. And they're all having influence. And so it's it, you talk about that synergistic effect. Instead of trying to get everybody on the same page here and, okay, we all need to say exactly this and this is how you answer these questions – you know, there's innovation, yeah. and, and there there are people who are moving the needle in ways that, that others of us go, oh, I hadn't thought of that way. I and, could learn from that. And extending this free market uh, comparison or, or analogy even more, 
um, talk to an entrepreneur about how many failures they had before they had a success, right? So when you're out networking and you're saying, I've got this idea or I've got this audience or I've got this network or whatever, right? And so time to go network and grow and multiply. You're going to fail. You're going to meet a lot of people where you're like, oh, okay, that was interesting. You're like in my pocket right now from FeeCon and then from a conference I went to right before, I have a ton of business cards from people I met. And maybe one or two of those people will end up with a relationship where something magical happens. For other people, it's just like, hey, it's it's good to know you're there doing what you're doing. I'm glad you know what I'm doing. Maybe in the future something will come of that. And that's also happened where a connection I made, you know, three years ago, they think, oh, hey, I know this person that needs to know you and you guys would, you know, make something magical together. So you never know what seeds you're planting. Um, and even the failures are okay. You know, don't consider it a waste of your time. Consider it research, right? You you need to go out and explore and find the people and the projects and the resources that are going to help you extend your influence, that's going to take time. You're never going to, you know, score gold on the very first time. Brian, you're out there at FeeCon, that's great, you're meeting a bunch of people, but it may take you another five conferences before you meet that one person where you're like, oh my gosh, this is now, you know, we're going to make those Liberty Babies together. I just love that analogy. <laughs> yeah, it's, there, there's something to be said too for uh, mentorship, which occurs when, when you network. Um, I don't know about you on your journey. I mean, you're you're a really good self-starter. Um, I I'm good to a point, but there comes a point where I bump up against the limits of my understanding or the limits of my abilities, and and I feel stifled. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, how do I go further from here? Mm -hmm. And it has been astonishing how every time I reach that point in my life, if I'm serious about I need to be doing more, a mentor appears. Mm -hmm. And I know it sounds mystical. Snatch the pebble from my hand, <laughs> grasshopper. But, but I swear to you, it happens every time the right person comes along and is there in the right place to, to help me gain what I need to go to go to that next step. Mm. And, and I know you've seen this because I see people come to you for mentorship. Um, and I'm starting to reach the point now where people are coming to me who are, you know, beginning their journey cool. and asking me, can, can you help me get to the next step? So yeah. there's, there's a great circle of life kind of analogy there. But um, don't overlook the opportunity that, uh, you know, when you need the mentor, they will be there. And let me touch on that last point. I remember I used to work um, on my college campus in the education department when I was a freshman. And there was this poster on the wall. I've heard things said like this uh, many times since. I've not uh, researched this myself. But apparently there is research that indicates that, you know, what you hear, you remember or retain. Like, these are not accurate figures, but kind of proportionally, you know, 3%. And, and what you uh, write you retain, you know, 18%. But what you teach, you retain like 93%, right? The whole point being that when you teach somebody else, it changes the depth of, of planting that information in your brain so that you retain it that much more. When you have the opportunity to be a mentor, when, when your networking shifts from, I need people to help me, to, yeah, I want to continue to grow and, and meet influential people, but I can also uh, help mentor people or bring people along, it's selfishly, it helps you a lot more because in the process, yeah, you're going to maybe convey information that you already solidly know, but you're going to be exposed to different, uh, you know, tasks or different requests that are maybe just outside your network. But now it's your obligation to research it and help that person that you're helping. And that information is going to stick in your mind. I've seen this personally time and again, where when I'm more in the teaching role, when I'm helping somebody else and we're uh, exchanging and creating that value together, it's helping me a ton too because it's pushing me just to the boundaries of my knowledge where I can then take a little bit step further and I'm increasing my own knowledge while I'm also helping somebody else. Again, another win-win situation. Okay, I have a question for you because obviously finding like-minded individuals, in, in the case of FeeCon, we were looking at people who were, um, they were big on freedom, they were big on free markets, they were big on character and, um, you know, just the, there's a lot that we agree on. How do you avoid the danger of simply trapping yourself in an echo chamber, you know, where, where everybody agrees with you and nobody ever um, gives you something to grow on? In other words, challenges your prevailing convictions. Oh, that's a great question. Um, because if you go to conferences such as this or events, right, typically those attract people who are already of a like mind. So your question, if I understand it right, Brian, is how do you kind of expose yourself through networking to different people, different ideas that can... And avoid only hearing the things that you want to hear. Look, social media is probably the best example of it. You know, mm -hmm. we, um, I, I think Facebook actually has algorithms that, that more or less help us create our own little echo chamber 
I don't want to see posts like this. I want to see posts, more posts like this. Yeah. So that feeds what we already like, hmm. but that's not how you grow, just hearing what you want to hear. Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I'm, I'm trying to think of, of how I would answer that. Part of me thinks like, okay, here's an example uh, with me, right? I can go to a uh, kind of libertarian-leaning conference. So like July, right, I'll be going to Freedom Fest in Vegas that they have every year down there. And I can rub shoulders with a lot of like-minded people, and I can feed my ego with people saying how great our work is, blah, 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 and, and make some good networking along the way with you know donors or whoever, right? Um, but to your question where how can you stretch and be pushed against and, and uh, have networking that maybe is giving you more critical feedback and helping you actually refine your blog, book, whatever it is that you're doing, podcast, um, the idea that comes to mind maybe is finding networks where you're kind of part of it, but it's not like a, a closely knit ideological group. The first thing that comes to mind is a political party, mm -hmm. right? If I go to, let's say, my state's Republican convention, the only thing that we have in common is that we've all checked a box on our you know, voter registration form that says, I'm going to be a Republican. But within that spectrum can be progressives, uh, communists, libertarians, conservatives, you know, moderates, whatever. And so here you can network through that organization where you have a common identity. Church, I think, can be a great thing. If, like, you know, I know a ton of my neighbors probably think I'm crazy, right, with everything that I do. And, and yet we have that point of common interest where I can use that networking to talk to them, do some research maybe, and see how these people feel about my ideas or, or how I feel about theirs. And maybe that will inform what I'm doing a little bit differently. But I, I'm curious, Brian, if you have a different answer. I'm just thinking, what are the networks out there that we can use that um, are comprised of people who we have a common identity with, but not necessarily a common ideology or a common you know, life mission, like if you go to FECON? Right. What are the other networks out there where you can still test out these ideas and grow your network, but uh, kind of stretch beyond just the ideological echo chamber? Right now, I, I'm being mentored by a guy who uh, was Glenn Beck's chief of staff for a number of years, and he brings some real key insights to the levels that he's worked at. He's, he has some real key insights on building audience. One of the things he pointed out to me is, okay, you start by building your audience by speaking persuasively to the people who are most likely to agree with you. But once you've got that core audience, that's when you can start to looking, you know, to, to expand and find people, you know, on the periphery or, uh, you know, in our case, you know, as, as it comes to, to freedom. Uh, the, the people who most intrigued me at this last conference that we attended at FECON were the innovators. And, and you have a nose for finding innovators, as anybody who's listened to the Society in the State podcast can attest. Um, there, there are a lot of really cool, innovative ideas out there that kind of challenge conventional wisdom, maybe don't require you to discard everything you knew before, but it's just, it's a new, and, and in some cases, a better way of approaching a particular problem or thinking about a particular problem. So um, I lean more towards towards the innovators, but also with the understanding that, uh, you know, you've got to preach to the choir sometimes initially, and sometimes that's where you're going to find the best reinforcement. Once you have that foundation, um, hopefully you're building something on top of that foundation. The, the thing I remember back from my days as a missionary for my church is the importance of opening your mouth, the importance of just talking to people. So often I think maybe we have self-doubt or we're you know introverted. Um, I mean, I'll, I'll be frank, I am, I am an introvert. I would prefer right now to go back in my room, close the door, and just focus on my work and, and have people leave me alone. And yet my mission and the cause I'm involved in compels me to work past that and to find opportunities to seek mentors and to, to build networks because there is a, an end goal uh, beyond myself that requires me to get over that. And um, I think about, you know, we all have our challenges. Uh, maybe we're uh, not confident that we provide value to other people, right? Like, why would that person want to meet me? What could I ever offer them in exchange? Um, I, I would say, you know, spend some time focusing on what your life mission is. What What is your purpose? What are your goals? And then, Embrace those goals so doggedly, so stubbornly um, that it allows you and, and impels you to overcome those doubts and challenges that we all have. I mean, we all have uh, th those self-doubts and, and challenges. And the hard part with all this, Brian, is as you go to these conferences, as you know, uh, like I so I, I speak to teenage groups a lot of times. And the one thing I try and convey, and regardless of the topic of speaking on, I say, can I leave you with another message before I go? 
I remember being a teenager. I, and even now I kind of feel like, you know, as a teenager, you see all these adults who kind of get it. And even now I'm like, oh, my gosh, there's all these people who get it. I said, uh, I, I say to these groups, I said that the one thing you need to know is that we have no clue what we're doing. That is like the secret of adulthood, <laughs> right? Like people look at me and I'm running two nonprofits now and I've written 14 books or whatever, right? And they, they see the, the work product and they have no idea that every night I look at the calendar. I'm like, how am I going to do that? Or what am I supposed to do? You know, most successful entrepreneurs will tell you they had no master plan. They don't know what they're doing. They just take one step at a time and figure it out as they go. There's no manual for life. That, and so as you network, don't be discouraged that you don't have it figured out and don't think that other people that you're trying to network with do have it figured out. Take solace in the fact that they're just another human like you. They struggle with many of the same things. Just have a good time. Be jovial and friendly. Be outgoing. And even if you don't have a ton of value, just just build your network by being friendly and complimenting other people and talking to them about everyone likes talking to them. Uh, other people about themselves, right? So, you know, there are ways to do this to grow your influence that don't require you to be like this amazing person with a ton of things that has it all figured out. I think we all need to network a little bit better and grow our audience, especially if we have that higher purpose and that goal um, that we're trying to attain beyond just, you know, the daily mundane tasks that we have. One of the big takeaways from one of the presentations at FECON was uh, there was a husband and wife couple that got up and spoke about, uh, you know, pursuing your purpose. And I think one of the greatest lessons they taught was just what you said. You don't have to know what you're doing. The most important step you're going to take is to commit and start moving forward in spite of the fact that you don't know what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you're a perfect example of you're, you're learning it as you go. And, and there may be times where you stumble or you fall. And, okay, that didn't work. But the bottom line is you're still committed. You're still moving forward. And the, the results, I think, speak for themselves. Well, guys, I, I think wherever you are at in life, hopefully take this as an opportunity to consider what are your goals, what's your purpose, and, and how can you build your network. If you want to network with us, please feel free to reach out. We'd love to get to know you and, and how we can work together and where some synergy lies between us. I think uh, practicing what you preach is important. And so if you guys want to reach out and let's talk about common areas of interest, please do. We love hearing from our listeners. You can find a contact page on the website, societyinthestate.com, or reach out to us on Facebook. Hope you guys are enjoying the podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to Society and the State. For show notes, archives, and more great content, visit societyandthestate.com.